some people have a view on life and they think that success uh, is in a certain quantity and that it's maybe only for certain people. Uh, but that is very, very much not the case. Success is there for the getting for anybody that wants to get it. A great way to get what you want out of life is to do something really simple, is to ask for it. Another way to get what you want out of life is to give people what they want. And that will lead you down a path that will open a lot of doors for you because people will want to do stuff for you. They'll want to give you opportunities because you gave something to them. The way I look at success is you can kind of think of success looking like the ocean. It kind of seems like there's an endless amount of water. There's an endless amount of supply there. But I think the biggest problem that I see is a lot of people are showing up to the ocean with a teaspoon. I've always been the person to show up to the ocean with a bucket and figure out a way to carry as much of that water as I possibly can, to figure out a way to gather up as much success as I possibly can. And the reason for it is, is because it's something that gets me out of bed in the morning. It's something that keeps me fired up because in this world that we're in, no one's going anywhere without shit to look forward to. And I look forward to every single day coming to this gym and stick it to my, sticking it to myself as hard as I possibly can. Whether it's the old days of squatting 900 pounds, 800 pounds, 1,000 pounds, benching over 800 pounds, or whether it's more of me doing burpees today. It doesn't matter what it looks like, it's still the same goal. The goal is to kick ass, and the goal is to be an intense motherfucker that's a force to be reckoned with. And that's the way I view it. That's the way I feel on the inside. That's not the way that I really am. I'm not really trying to burn other people alive, but that's the way I feel in my brain because I'm competitive, I'm a competitor. And I try to compete in every aspect of my life. I'm not thinking about necessarily competing with somebody on, say, like a deadlift. I'm thinking about the whole picture. I'm thinking about day to day. Every day when I come in here and train, there's been people that come into the workouts. They come in for a weekend or they come in, you know, we have guests come in. And I have a bullseye on my chest. I'm not worried about that bullseye because I have other targets in my life. I don't care if somebody beats me one-on-one -on -one in some of these training sessions. And I never did. Even when I was going after world record uh, lifts and powerlifting, I never, I never was stimulated by what anybody else was doing. I was stimulated by what I was doing. One of the reasons, and this might sound really crazy, but one of the reasons I don't read books is because I don't want to read other people's story. I'm in the middle of writing my own. I'm trying to forge my own path and create my own lane in my own way. And for all of you that are interested in trying to figure out ways of gathering success, try not to think about it being limited because Jeremy Avila is here today and he's uh, deadlifted 887 pounds. That doesn't mean there's no room for us to deadlift successfully as well. There's more weight to go around for everybody. There's always a new challenge for you to tackle. There's always something new for you to strive for or for you to aspire towards. We got Sarah here who has deadlifted over 600 pounds. We got Tiny Tiff in the house today who's set all-time world records. But just because they've had success doesn't mean that it's not there for you. And maybe it will look different for you because maybe you have different goals and maybe you don't want to carry all those buckets of success around the way that they have in their particular field because it just might not make sense for your lifestyle and the different things that you're trying to do and the different things that you're trying to achieve. As we look at each day, there's always opportunities to cut corners. As we think about, as we wear down during the course of a day, normally if you're going to cheat on your diet, or normally if you're going to make a mistake, it's going to be the latter half of the day where you're really going to mess up. And then why is that? It's because the day has beaten the shit out of you. And you're like, I surrender. Or you think, you think uh, to yourself um, that you deserve it because today was a hard day. Today was a really long day. You know, I, I really worked really hard, and now I'm going to sit down with this Ben and Jerry's. But those kinds of things are a trick. Um, those kinds of things, they're going to lead you down the wrong path because that's not truly what you want. 
You might want it at the moment, and it does feel great to have it. That's actually one of the problems with food, is it does solve a problem for a moment, but it doesn't solve a problem for the bigger picture. It doesn't solve a problem for the long term. And if we think about that with food, we're going to end up uh, we're going to end up kind of wearing that. You're going to be wearing food on your body that your body can survive off of for several days, and you don't need any food because you have plenty already stored away for you, right? But you don't see that. It doesn't show up. It's not something that everyone else can see as you walk down the street in terms of success. I mean, I guess you could wear something fancy and show people that you had enough money to purchase something, but other than that, you're not going to be really wearing success, and you're not going to really be wearing failure. But the problem is you are wearing it, and it is eating at you, because you haven't made the changes that you so desperately wanted to make. If you're going to be good at anything, it's going to take years. It's going to take decades. Jesse Burdick and I have been uh, coaching powerlifters around the world for, I don't know, the last 20 years. And we have never met one person that's worth a shit in powerlifting that hasn't been doing it for like 10 years. That's always like kind of an underlying rule. And I, I, I ran into a kid one time. He was about 18 years old, and he squatted like 765 for like a triple. And I was like, shit, there goes my stupid 10-year rule. And then his dad comes over and is like, yeah, man, he's been so good at lifting ever since he was about five years old. <laughs> I was like, it's still true. It's still holding up. That is a really long time. And lifting, lifting in a lot of ways sucks. Because you're not going to really, you can see results in terms of strength, and I think that's why we're all here, because we're obsessed with getting stronger. But to see changes in your body, it's a combination of reining in the amount of sleep that you get, pay, paying attention to your hydration, paying attention to everything that you eat and consume in a given day. And it, it, gets, to be very, it gets to be very difficult, it gets to be very challenging, because nutrition is a 24-7 process. Getting stronger, you go to the gym, and you get a good stimulation. You stimulate the muscles. You don't annihilate them. You send a nice message to your central nervous system, like, hey, we're going to work on getting stronger. You send a message that is clear enough, body gets the picture, and then there you are six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years later, and you're actually strong because it's something that you built up over time. It just takes a long time. When it comes to the nutrition side of things, it's just very difficult because it's a 24-7 process. With the lifting, you get in the gym, you get two hours of training, you get home from the gym, you get enough sleep, and you do a couple of other things okay, and you'll get a lot of the results that you want. Some people want to optimize that and have a quicker route, and so they might be more militant towards it, might be more dedicated towards it. Sometimes I think when we're trying to think about success, maybe we have the wrong picture in our head or the wrong idea. And you'll sometimes hear people say, you know, careful what you wish for. You know, I was always like, hey, you know, it would be amazing if I could just never have a job. That would be legit. <laughs> and here I am now, you know, working about 24-7, it feels like sometimes, even though this is all stuff that I love, so it doesn't always feel like work. But I'm on the hook to produce all the time, or at least it, it feels that way. And that's probably my own doing, because I put my own stresses on myself. But you get the picture. You never really get the freedom that you're looking for, even if you start to achieve some success, even if you start to get financial freedom, or you start to get some freedom with your physique, you start to get in better shape. I still can't stop. I still can't slow down. I still don't eat any carbs. I think people are probably thinking, oh, like once I get to this, then I'll be able to play because I put in the hard work. And it's like that doesn't work that way. Once you get to this, you're going to be working harder than ever. And I know it can kind of deflate some of the hopes and dreams that you might have towards certain things. But as you go through the process, you'll be so strong mentally, physically, and emotionally that you won't even care. You'll be diving into it and leaning into it harder. I oftentimes talk about leaning into the resistance of life. And I've learned those lessons here in the gym. I learned those lessons through powerlifting. Powerlifting has given me so much, it's hard to even put into words. But when you go in the gym and you lift a heavy weight, the easiest way to lift a heavier weight on the next set is to 
do nothing, <laughs> is to rest, it's to recover. I feel like I have done everything in my life that way. I feel like I put in a good, strong effort, I maxed out on something, I gave it a max effort, and then I was like, man, I better, I better rest on that a little bit. I better rest and recover, not because I really want to, but because it's just part of the process. If you don't rest and recover, if you don't lick your wounds, they won't get any better. You won't be able to be stronger because you are fatigued. You are tired. Remember what I said earlier about eating. Why do you make that choice to run to the gas station and buy candy bars at 11 o'clock at night? It's because you're fatigued and you're beat up from the day and you think that you really deserve it or you think that you need it. You let your defenses down. Don't let your defenses down. Keep them up at all times. You can have everything that you want. It's all there. It's all sitting right there. All you have to do is try to figure out a way to work for it. And then you want to be giving as well. In order for you to be able to receive the things that you need in this world, you're going to have to give. And you're going to have to give a lot, and you're going to have to give a lot with your heart. And it's sometimes going to be painful. It's sometimes going to be time-consuming. But it will pay off in the long run. One of the most giving people that I know is here today, my buddy Jesse Burdick. I'm super excited that he's here and he's going to share a lot of deadlift tips with you guys. Jesse doesn't have 4 million followers on Instagram. You want to know why? Because he's always fucking working. He's got his head down. He's working his ass off. And when he's not working, he's with his children. And when he's not with his children, he's with his wife and so on. And there's a lot of people in this world that are like that. And I'd like to see those type of people get more respect. He's the strongest guy I've ever met. He barely missed a 854-pound deadlift, just so I like to give him shit. But I think best deadlift is 816? 826. 826. I always jip him on it. His best deadlift is 826, but when I say he's the strongest person I ever met, it has nothing to do with what I've seen in the gym. Well, it's got a little something to do with what I've seen in the gym because he's... He's intense, and he's hard to work out with. We used to train together a lot, and he used to kick my ass. He used to bury me, and it was embarrassing. He made me better, though, because as I was training with him, he was, I mean, in the beginning, he was beating me by like a plate, and he was a driving force behind me starting a hit list, and I started writing out a list, and some of my best friends were even on that list, and I'm like, I I'm going to fucking put a line through all these motherfuckers at some point. I was so tunnel vision about my goals and what I wanted, and I asked for it. I wrote stuff down. I wrote down this hit list. I knew exactly how strong Jesse was. I knew exactly what it took to be able to try to defeat him. I knew exactly what it would take to beat my training partner, Scott Cartwright, who squatted 1160. I never got him on the 1160, but I beat him head to head twice, and I beat his total, and I beat him enough. <laughs> And I was able to do that with a lot of people. What happened was, is I started to know more and more people. So the list started to grow. And eventually, I was not no longer able to uh, beat some of the other monsters that started coming into powerlifting. But because I had those goals, and because I had things lined up, I was taking all of the different things that I knew that would get me to that goal. All right, here's the goal. And then I would work my way backwards. I see so many people are studying the roots they're studying the science of the roots. And I've always been the person that just comes up and picks up the fruit. Because I don't fucking care how stuff happens. I don't care how stuff is done. I don't care what made the fruit grow there. I just want to eat it. I just always wanted to try to get the results. And the way that you get results is to get around like-minded people. Get around people that are savages. Get around people that are uncompromising. Jesse's not going to... When we were training together, he's not going to let me slack off. Even now, if I called him, I said... If I said, hey, man, like, I don't know what's going on, but I'm like, in a slump. I mean, he would be compassionate for about two seconds. And he'd be like, dude, come on. What are you talking about here? What's really going on? How do we get you back on track? Let's make a new goal. Let's set a new goal. We did the same thing for him after his brother passed away. We started setting other goals. He was depressed. He was going through a divorce. I hope I'm not airing out too much stuff here, but he was going through a divorce. He was going through a lot of different things all happening at the same time. Life was crashing down on him harder than you can possibly imagine. We had enough communication to where we started talking about, okay, well, you don't want to eat because you're depressed. Guess where our mind shifted to? Hey, man, what a great opportunity that is to be in a different weight class in a powerlifting meet. 
maybe we can like have fun with this. And Jesse was like, yeah, you know. But we worked it out, and then he was like, fuck yeah. You know what? That is a good goal. You're right. That would be cool. Then he looked into it more and came back to me and said, you know what? I don't think there's been a lot of people in the history of powerlifting to total elite in five different categories. Like I couldn't really find a lot of information on who's done it, but it looks like there's only been two or three other people in the history of the sport that have ever done it. At the time, Jesse was you know, over 300 pounds, but then he was coming down because he wasn't eating at the time. And he was like 270. And so he's telling me, he's like, hey, you know, maybe I'll go down to 220 and get an elite total there, and maybe I'll go to 242, get an elite total there. He already had two, to- two elite totals at two- one elite total at 275, one at 308, and he needed to bulk back up to get that super heavyweight title, which was going to be the fun part, right? Well, as he was working his way through this process, it gave him enough focus. It gave him enough distraction. He was able to lift through it because he had a goal that was powerful enough to give him a really strong purpose. When you have children, that's like an automatic thing. Like you, you all of a sudden are burdened with this crazy purpose that uh, maybe you didn't understand what you're going to sign up for. But they give you a tremendous amount of purpose. They give you a tremendous amount of fulfillment. So from that end, he was good on that part. But you need to also fill yourself up. Because if you're not somebody, if you don't feel like a somebody in this world, you're going to feel like a nobody. In order to feel like a somebody, you have to accomplish stuff. You have to do things. And you can't, you can't go, the, the lowest form of conversation is talking about the shit that you used to do. That doesn't hold up. That doesn't work. Imagine, you know, going to the bank and trying to take money out and say, yeah, man, 10 years ago I kicked ass and I, you know, I did this, I worked really, really hard, you know, see if I can, you know, extract the money out of my bank account. They're like, no, you're not currently doing anything, so you didn't earn anything. You have to constantly and consistently keep pushing forward in some way. You're going to have to hold on to a goal. You're going to have to hold on to a dream. And the people around you are going to always be there. The people around you that maybe shouldn't be there, they're going to be always, they'll always be there to take your dreams, crumble them up, and throw them in the garbage. It will happen to you over and over again. That's why it's important that you're around like-minded people. There's a saying, and I've been sharing it forever. It's something I got from Louis Simmons in my time at Westside Barbell. If you walk with the lame, you will develop a limp. That is so critical. I hope if you take anything away from me babbling up here for a while, I I hope that's something that you even write down. I hope that's something that you really pay attention to. Because if you're walking around with like-minded people, if you want to be strong, ask people. If you want to be strong, Get around people that want to be strong. Get around people that have better and stronger habits than you. My brother and I, we go out to eat often. And I'm sure there's times, he and I are pretty dialed into our nutrition nowadays, so it's not as big of a deal as it used to be. Maybe two years ago, three years ago, when we'd go out to eat, it might be like, hey, like, I'm going to see what he orders. <laughs> and if he, you know, if he eats you know, uh, junk, then I'm going to put in the same order. You know, I'll make, make it two, right? But if he has a healthy meal, and then he would play off of me too. But you want to try to get around people that are like-minded, that have similar goals. Now we have similar goals. So I know for sure, if I want to make sure that I'm just mainly eating meat, then I'm going to go hang out with him. If you want to be a bodybuilder, hang out with bodybuilders. You want to be a power lifter, hang around power lifters. Whatever it is that you want to do, try to get around those people and try to absorb as much as you possibly can from those people. If you walk with the lame, you're going to develop a limp, and that's why today I brought in Jesse Burdick, Jeremy Avila, and a few others uh, to share their journey and to share how they've gotten strong. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jesse Burdick, just in case anyone didn't know. This is Jeremy Avila. Woo! Also, yeah! Um, yeah! And then we have Tiny Tiff, Sarah Schiff here. So we brought a, we brought a crew of deadlifters down for you guys to kind of hang out. Um, I want to say thanks to Mark for the introduction and for that talk. Uh, I don't know if you guys watch every single one of his um, Instagram videos and YouTube stuff, but I do. And I've known the guy for 20-some-odd years. 
and I still can't get enough of it because the guy has helped me out more than anybody, has inspired me more than anybody else. And without him, I think a lot of people, well, I don't know, there's 75, 100 people here that wouldn't be here without him. So can we give Mark a hand for doing what he does? Thank you. Um, so, and, you know, when I was, when, when Mark asked me to do this, uh, as far as like kind of the deadlift seminar and everything, it's, it, it's always funny because it's like, yeah, absolutely, no problem, whatever. What do you want me to do? I don't know. Do you, well, what, are we, what do you want to, you want to have them lift? What do you want to have me talk about? How do I deal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, oh, cool. So <laughs> just whatever then. That's great. On the way up, I was telling Jeremy about when Mark and I used to do these seminars all the time. I used to have a whiteboard that I would write up. And most of it was jokes. <laughs> and most of it was to kind of fool the audience. They never worked. Those it never worked either. Um, but it was mostly to keep us on track. Because what would happen is we would start talking, telling stories, trying to get people through whatever it was. And then a half an hour later, it'd be like, hey, what, where, where were we? Like, oh, we're right here. Okay, cool. So now we're going to keep going this way. So um, this is kind of just the way that we roll. This is just the way that we do things where, you know, because we've been around for so long and doing this for so long, we can kind of pick up and just kind of roll with everything. And something that has always impressed me about Mark is his thought process. Um, if you've watched any of his videos, you know that he doesn't have a conventional thought process. And, you know, growing up in school, they told him he had the wrong thought process, that he did things wrong, he did things backwards. Well, fuck those people, because they're wrong. Everyone has a different process, right? And if you can kind of take a step back and look at someone's journey, look at the road that they traveled to get there, you'll start to understand that there's always going to be different views on things. There's always going to be things that you do different, maybe things that worked for you but don't work for somebody else. And for Mark, taking a step back and looking at things from the slingshot all the way to, you know, up to super training gym, it was a very unconventional way of doing things. Um, and this is something that I want to start to talk about as far as the deadlift goes. Because we can sit up here and talk all day about the intricacies of the deadlift and where angles and this and weight and blah, 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 blah. But I think people are looking in a microscope and they should kind of take a couple of steps back, kind of take use some binoculars and look at things really kind of around things, okay? We all for the general, you know, point of things, know how to deadlift. It's, I asked Benny Dick Magnus in this, and it was the best answer I ever received. Hey, what are you thinking when you uh, go up there and deadlift? He goes, well, I go to the bar, and I, uh, I grab it, and then I pick it up. Like, sweet, man. <laughs> that was awesome. So that's the seminar. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, so, so what you got to think about is, you know, you have Benedict Magnuson, probably one of the best deadlifters of all time. He, guess what's happening? He's not thinking when he's going up to deadlift. He's just deadlifting, right? But it's all the other stuff that you want to understand about Benedict Magnuson that got him to where he was before, that made him one of the best deadlifters of all time. So what I want to do today is talk about some of this stuff, right? We're going to get to lift because... I don't have a long enough attention span to talk to you guys about stuff because we need to get moving and do everything that we did. Uh, and we need to deadlift and get you guys working out. And that's something that Mark and I would always do when we would do seminars. We're like, look, we don't, we're gonna, we have to lift almost like in 15 minutes anyways, so we're gonna get up and start moving. So just suffer through this, I swear to God, it won't be that long. Um, I wanna talk to you guys about all the other stuff around deadlifting before we get to deadlift, okay? Um, like Mark said, Mark wants to go and go ahead, go ahead and just grab the fruit and go. And that's what he looked like when he deadlifted. Whenever he would talk to me, I would try and pull him back and try and get him to kind of understand some other stuff and get him going forward. But again, Mark has a different way of learning, and he looks at things different. So what I want to try and help you guys understand is, you know, how you learn is different from who you're sitting next to and who's sitting next to them. And that's okay. That doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. That doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. 
All it means is the coach or whoever's telling it to you hasn't told you in a way that you understand yet. Because that's what coaching is, saying the same thing over and over and over again. And then a new coach. In different ways. A new coach will yeah. say something to somebody, and then that athlete will go back to Jesse. Like, I might say something new to Jeremy, and Jeremy This has actually Jesse. really happened, too, It'll be like, oh, my God, the problem the whole time is I needed to keep my chin up a little bit more. And Jesse would be like, I've been saying that for the last eight years. <laughs> so, you know, but it did t- sometimes it does take that long. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that you're learning a little bit different, and you need a different voice to tell you something in a different way. And it's literally happened to Jeremy where I was trying so hard to get him to use his hips, open up his knees when he's at the bottom of a deadlift. And came up here randomly, came back on a Monday or a Tuesday. He's like, yeah, you know, Mark gave me this really good cue. He told me to kind of push my knees out at the bottom of the deadlift. I was like, man, fuck you guys. Like, what the hell? Uh, it took me that long to kind of get it through. But that's okay. You know, life happens that sometimes. And maybe he wasn't ready to hear it at the start. And it took him a while to kind of get there. So, you know, let's, let's talk through that, right? What does that mean? It means that you know, you're going to have to hear the same thing over and over again. You're going to have to think about things differently. And if the progress has kind of stopped, you've got to attack a problem you know, around it more than anything else. So something that Mark and I have talked about a lot is you know, finding someone on YouTube that you really like and watching them. But the correct way to do it is find someone that you really like on YouTube who looks and moves like you and teaches and coaches in a way that you understand. That's why I follow Tiny Tiff. <laughs> yes. So, but I mean, uh, so when you're doing all the other stuff around, when you're doing your research, when you're thinking about talking about the deadlift with other people, you know, ask everybody. But, you know, have a, have a little bit of that face where you're like, I don't know, you're six foot four and 400 pounds. I don't know if you're going to really give me, uh, you know, kind of one of those lightning bolts that's going to make me deadlift better, right? So, you know, let's, as we're going to go through our deadlift today, you're going to have a lot of different coaches saying a lot of different things, probably meaning the same thing, but it's sounding a little bit different. I want you guys to start thinking about what you're hearing, what makes sense to you, and what you can put in practice, because everybody does learn differently. study just came out that found that almost 80% of athletes, collegiate and above, do not do well with auditory cueing and coaching. So what does that mean? We need to do it visual, and we need to do it it kinesthetic. And then there's everything in between. You're you're probably a little bit of each of those. Does that make sense? So auditory, hearing, visual, seeing, kinesthetic, touching, and kind of putting you into a position, right? You're usually gonna fall into one of those categories. When you have a coach, when you're having, you know, when you're trying to learn something, listen to something, see something, try and understand how you're taking in information and how it really sticks and how it makes sense to you. And keep going after that stream, that channel, whatever it ends up being. And start to understand yourself because the more you understand how you're, you learn, the better you're going to learn. Does that make sense to everybody, right? So, and those are the people you want to pay attention to and those are the cues so if you hear someone, hear someone saying like, hey, knees out this way, opposed to like, look where your knees are, or someone pokes you in the knee, like, oh, knees out, saying the same thing, trying to get the same result, but you got to say it in different ways, and you got to learn it in different ways, right? So my challenge to you guys is to learn how to learn today, and hopefully with that, you'll be able to move forward a lot faster, because you won't get lost in just the ton of information that's out there, right? There's so many people who are trying to tell you a thousand different things, a thousand different ways, and sell you a thousand different products um, that's supposedly gonna help you do all one thing, right? But you gotta find which one of those and who to listen to. And when you find that person, grab onto them, and hopefully that's why you're here. Um, But there's always intricacies and levels in everything that we're doing. So my goal was to Make sure that you guys can kind of learn how to learn today and focus in on what cues make sense, how you like to be coached, because all this is very important in being an athlete. Um, And as a coach, it's taken me a very, very long time to learn how to coach properly. And 
I have three of my biggest challenges with me here today um, in Jeremy, Tiff, and Sarah. And they all present with amazingly cool, different, hair-pulling-out problems for me every day. I got to get Jeremy to the gym on time with, like, all of his stuff, which doesn't happen. He actually has matching socks on today, which hasn't happened in two weeks. Tiny Tiff is here, again, on time and with her hair combed, which is amazing. So everyone has different challenges for you. And when Mark's telling you guys to lean into life, if you're a coach, if you're an athlete, if you're an educator, if you're a parent, when you have challenges, it's too easy to just be like, oh my God, you're fucking killing me here, dude. Like, I can't deal with you today. But what good is that going to do him? And what good is that going to do me? Be like, all right, let's meet halfway. Let's figure this shit out. Why do you have two fucking socks on? Like, well, I got up late because I went to bed late because I was playing video games and I was at the casino. And they gave me a free meal. This is totally just, you know, this didn't happen last night. Um, you know, it, and then I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So now to me, I'm learning about a situation where I'm like, hey, okay, maybe, you know, learning how to deadlift isn't great today. Maybe let's talk about, like, recovery. You know, it's, you, you should probably sleep some a little bit. And then, you know, if you sleep a little bit more often, then you'll be able to get up and move forward and kind of go from there. So you got to think about every situation and every time that you're dealing with somebody as a teaching and a learning moment. And if you have that in your head so you can take what you absorb, hopefully, today and pass it along to somebody else, it's going to make you understand it and it's going to make, make it part of you even more. So those are my challenges for you guys today is to kind of take all that learning, understand how you learn, understand how you like to be taught, and kind of move forward with things. My other goal is to convince you guys to stop deadlifting. For a deadlift seminar, odd advice, right? Um, when I met Jeremy when he came to the gym for the first time, he was deadlifting approximately three times a week. And he was deadlifting heavy three times a week. And your deadlift at that time was? 665, 661, 666 if we're using uh, kilos, right? And I proposed this crazy thing to him. I was like, hey man, I think we need to deadlift a lot less in order for you to deadlift more. His head exploded. But he kept doing the same thing, and I just let him do the same thing, and he just kept running into the same door. And eventually he was just like, you know what, I want to stop running into this, running into the same problem over and over again. Can you help me out? And he started doing the program that we have. And, you know, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, more about that once we get to the Q&A. But if you're deadlifting heavy more than twice a month, I think you're missing the mark. Okay? So I want you to kind of think about that and understand that you can get a hell of a lot better at a really fucking cool lift that when you lift big makes you look awesome and super cool and pumps everybody up by doing less than you're doing now, most likely doing less than you're doing right now, okay? So what we're going to go over now is we're going to go over, um, and this is a very loose, you know, this, this doesn't have to be Mark and I kind of talking up here. If you guys have questions as we go, please just kind of raise your hand and we'll kind of get to them. Only thing is, is let's just try and make sure we talk clearly so everyone will kind of understand so we can all keep learning from this. But we're going to go over conventional and sumo deadlift, how I teach it, what we're looking for. Um, we're going to go over good things, bad things, faults, what those faults mean. And you're going to be able to get to see three um, world-class lifters do it who uh, <laughs> have fairly different body makeup styles and everything. So you're going to get to see a real wide variety of movement, which I think is really important because they, do, they all do a lot of things really, really well, but they also do them very, very differently than each other. And I want to tell you guys why it works for some people, why it work, doesn't work for them, and how you guys can kind of take that, take a kernel of something, take a lightning bolt, and apply it to your training, your deadlifting, et cetera. So let's have, um, we're going to go Jeremy and Sarah here, and Tiff over here. And Mark and I are just going to kind of start to talk through some of the deadlifting. 
Um, so we'll have Tiny kind of take the uh, conventional stance over here. And we'll show kind of from the side and uh, fr from the front and from the side. We'll go front for now. Um, so everyone can kind of see some of the stuff that we're going to talk about. So hold on, stand up. So before she gets the bar, her feet are underneath her hips right now, okay? I deal with high schoolers a lot, and I say that, say, hey, feet are underneath your hips. It's like, what's up? It's like, your ass ain't that big, homie. <laughs> okay? So your hips, they're probably going to be a lot closer, and that's going to be something that you're probably going to hear and may be surprised by, that we're going to tell you to move your stance in a little bit. Everyone has a tendency, for whatever reason, to get way, way out here. She's got her feet underneath her hips. Her toes are pointed straight-ish. Okay? So she's set up. How close are you to the bar? is gonna depend on your mobility flexibility. I recommend trying to do something that puts you in the same place over and over again so you know where you are. So I like to have people kind of count the eyelets on their shoes and make sure that she's covering the second or third eyelet or whatever it is. Does that make sense? So everyone knows what an eyelet is, right? Okay, cool. Uh, this is shiny silver circles on your shoes. One, think, uh, one note on that is uh, just kind of depending on your mobility uh, that'll determine how far, how close you might need to get to the bar. If you have less mobility, you might need to be pulled back from the bar a little bit. If you have more mobility, you might be able to squat down in a really good position uh, pretty close to the bar. So just, it's going to be a little different for each person. So in general, now that we've kind of got the stance and everything taken care of, there's going to be kind of two options for her to set up and grab the bar. She's going to go and get a nice big breath of air into kind of her abdomen and her middle at the top, or she's gonna go down to the bar, get her hands set, then take her air in, and then come up. Does everybody understand the difference? Can you show us real quick? Do the top. And, no, you're fine. Okay. okay, and then do the bottoms up. Good, that was a really big deep breath. Everyone could tell, you did great. Good job. <laughs> Tiff's not, Tiff's gonna go ahead and tell us a story here too. She's not awkward at all. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. She doesn't want to talk whatsoever. Um, so can you go from the side real quick, Tiff? Just turn the bar. When you're taking that air, if you're at the bottom of the deadlift, it's normally easiest to do it with your legs kind of straight. Your hips are going to be high. Otherwise, if you're like you're in a solid deadlift position trying to breathe, it's hard to really gather the air that you need. So straighten the legs out, put your butt really high on purpose, get a lot of air, get in position, and then go. And that's going to be based on comfort and whatever you deadlift the most with. You know, there's a um, there's an old West Side lifter named uh, Chester who used to literally just dive bomb. He would take the biggest deep breath he could and just jam down to the bar and just rip the thing up. His name was John Stafford. It was, he deadlifted 832, I think, yeah. at APS Seniors one time. It was the fastest 800-pound deadlift I'd ever seen to that point, and it made no sense whatsoever. Um, I'd really never seen anyone do that because conventional... The wisdom would tell you that that's just not going to work. But again, that's one of those examples that it worked for him, and uh, he took it all the way to, you know, very, very high. So we're going to go ahead and talk about kind of standards that we're looking for here for Tiny Tiff when she's setting up. So let's get you to the bottom here. Okay, her back is flat-ish, okay? So you can stand up. We're going to talk a little bit. So I wrote an article a long time ago in this magazine called Power Magazine, Hey. If you hit. <laughs> Shameless plug number what, four? I need six today, um, so expect two more. Um, cues that, were, that you hear a lot of people yelling at powerlifting meets were originally invented for dinosaurs who were the first powerlifters, mm -hmm. okay? So when you tell a guy who's 330 pounds to get his back straight, this is what it looks like. Straight, straight, straight. Or instead of saying straight, 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 we could just say, hey, don't round, <laughs> okay? But for that instance, it was like, you know, back flat, tight, 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 arch, arch, arch. Now, do we really want to have Tiff arch so much that she touches the back of her head to her ass? No, that's not going to work really well at all for cool a deadlift. Trick. Well, maybe somebody does. Um, so we're going to ask her to have a flat-ish back. <laughs> don't worry. I'll t we'll, we'll talk later. Um, so her back is going to be flat-ish, and her, her, um, her hips are going to end up being lower than her shoulders. Okay? Does that make sense? That's a lot lower. Good. So it can be anywhere, any variety in there. Can you straighten your legs out? There you go. So see, they're kind of even, and now she's going to pull herself into good position. 
and she's going to deadlift somewhere in between there. Where will that be for you? I don't know. We'll see. Everybody's got different leverages like we talked about. Or we're talking, talking in general terms here. Flat back, flat-ish back, right? Hips are going to be lower than your shoulders. That's going to be a great way to start um, for the conventional deadlift. Questions on conventional deadlift so far? And she's also was pulling herself in a position, as Jesse was saying, she's using the bar to leverage herself into proper position. If you just try to squat down and you just try to get in position, sometimes uh, you're not going to have that tightness necessary to get a good start in the deadlift. A lot of times we'll see someone's hips shift up and they do what I refer to as like a two-part lift. It looks like a combination between like a regular deadlift and a stiff leg deadlift. So let's have Tiff do a uh, sumo setup. And we'll also have Jeremy do his set sumo setup so you can kind of see a couple of different variations. So here, her, um, her stance, her feet are going to be wider than her hips, right? Um, and she's going to do that because everybody can do that, right? No, so so from, from this position, what she's going to do is she's going to keep her back straight, and she's going to descend by kind of pushing her knees out and squatting down until she can touch the bar. She's going to go ahead and kind of straighten herself out again, making sure her back's flat, pulling, oh, slipping a little bit, and then regaining it and then get in a good tall position and go from there. So at this point, her hips are automatically going to be lower than her shoulders, right? So what we do is we kind of focus, we turn the focus around to her chest. We always talk about kind of the logo, showing everybody the logo on your shirt when you're going to be deadlifting. Everybody knows that, you know, you want to have strong or super training or what other things do I have to plug? All that stuff. All that stuff on, you know, show off that logo, make sure, you know, it gets on the Instagrams. So it's going to be working on getting her chest up more than getting her hips down, okay? Can you do that again, Tiff? Nice and tall, and then her hips are through. Good. So can you pull the slack out of the bar? I just want everybody to listen what pulling the slack out of the bar sounds like. Did everybody hear that kind of click? That's the collars of the bar hitting the top, the top bit of the inside of the, the weight. It's going to sit in the middle until you pull it up to the top. By pulling it up to the top, you're putting energy into that bar. That bar is having a little bit of a flex to it, and it's also going to help you kind of rev up your engine. Mark always talks about instead of going from 0 to 60, let's go from 30 to 100. Right? You're already there. You're already in second or third gear. I don't know, I don't know which gear that is. Um, but, they, but it's better, right? That's higher. Is that how it works? <laughs> totally a car guy over here. Um, so that's what we're talking about when we're saying kind of pull the slack out of the bar. Okay? Um, can you do that one more time? What else? And kind of hang at the bottom for me. What I want everybody to kind of look at is this triangle right here. And can you stand up and do conventional as well? Yeah. When she starts, there's this triangle kind of on the side here. So when you see coaches, kind of tilt their head over this way and they kind of come off to the side. What they're looking for is, you know, what's going on in this area. And what I'm looking for is this kind of triangle. I want this triangle to close as quickly and efficiently as possible. Does that make sense to everybody? So let's have you do a stiff leg deadlift. And I just want you to see how much daylight happens to you. So set up and then kind of kick your, she's going to kick up. See a lot more area. That triangle gets a lot bigger before it gets a lot smaller. Does everybody see that? Does that make sense to everybody, right? So let's do the same thing, sumo. Same thing. So we're going to want to keep this really closed and efficient. And you're just going to kick your legs up. <laughs> She's natural. <laughs> um, so go back to conventional. So when, when you're going to hear a lot of people kind of turning to the side, and this is something that you guys can look for while... Other people are lifting as well. You can kind of look for this triangle and see if they're going to be efficient kind of closing that stuff up. So cues to fix that are going to vary from chest up, keep your hips closer to the bar, use more legs, whatever it is. Because a lot of times, mostly, your hips are going to kick up and that triangle is going to get a lot bigger before you get your hips to kind of close. Does that make sense to everybody? As we kind of go, it'll, it'll get a little bit better and better once you see it. Typically, with a sumo deadlift, too, you're going to get right up on the bar. It's rare that anyone would be like all that far away from the bar. So you notice she's got the high socks on so you don't end up with uh, crazy bloody shins or a lot of scars like I got here. And you're going to be right up on the bar for most people. And in a sumo deadlift, normally 
the knee doesn't travel forward. It might travel forward for someone with like really long legs or something, but normally the, the shin angle is straight up and down. On a conventional deadlift, you actually want to drive the knees forward a little bit. You actually want to have the knees, and that's why we're giving ourselves space. We need that room because if we don't have room, we're going to kick the barbell forward a little bit. And what Jesse's talking about with, with keeping everything in tight and keeping everything in close is really a, kind of a simple thing, and we do it on bench, squat, and deadlift. In all three movements, we want to keep uh, our thoracic spine, keep our chest, kind of keep it locked into position. It's not necessarily about it like just being like up, although it is kind of what you're thinking about because you have some weight here. You want to really lock it in and, and keep it in that position because if we go to do a deadlift and we're like this, then we end up with the bar way out in front of us, and the, it's going to be very, very difficult to lock that bar out because the weight is going to get so far out in front of you. So what we're going to have here is have uh, Jeremy and uh, Sarah kind of start to lift a little bit over here, and we'll have Tiff lift as well, and we're going to kind of talk you through some of what they're doing, maybe have them talk to you guys about how they're approaching the lift, what they're thinking, what cues have worked for them, and then uh, we're basically going to have them do you know, somewhat of a speed session here today. Uh, they were joking to, again, try and drive me crazy and make me pull the rest of the hair out that I have that they're going to work up to openers today um, because they have the meat coming up. But we're probably not going to do that because we don't have a ton of time, but we're going to go ahead and have them move the bar, show you what a dynamic effort session for these guys um, looks like, and we're going to kind of go from there. Hopefully you guys can use this again kind of as a, as a time to see a couple different people deadlift really, really well. So take what they're using well, you know, write down some questions, and we're going to try and talk them through it and talk you guys through it. But uh, hopefully this will be a way where you can kind of both see, hear, and eventually kind of feel, watch, and do um, the deadlift and kind of see and, and pick up things, do things better, and try and maybe even mimic what you're going to see here. So Jeremy is going to go ahead and pull over here. Jeremy has a little bit of a hybrid style in his um, sumo deadlift, meaning... He's a lot quicker. Uh, a TIFF setup is very much methodical and um, well thought out and planned, where Jeremy <laughs> just fell out of bed and needs to get this done really quick because he's starving and he doesn't have any beef jerky or rock stars and he has to get to the gas station. Go. go. <laughs> so again, his toes are going to be kind of out, feet are a little bit wider. I'm going to go ahead and kind of push his knees out, get set up, and pull. What you guys may not see is like from the side position here, he's doing such a good job of rotating his, his knees outward. He's in a real straight up and down, he's in a real straight up and down position. So if you watch him here from the side, this is, this is a skill. Like, I, I don't have the ability to do that. Now, I could work on it for a long time and maybe end up with that ability, but this is something that he's developed over a long period of time with his coach. And so it makes the movement really smooth and really efficient. He's able to put a lot of power behind that. For some of you, if you tried to get in that position, you might actually even feel weaker at first because it's something that's going to take time to develop. So you're watch these are high-level lifters. And so some of what you're going to see today is it's actually, or not some of it, all of it, it's actually very special what these guys are able to do. Now we're going to have Sarah. So we're starting out a plate, and we're going to go ahead and work up. I don't know what we're going to work up to, but I just want to show you guys, you know, what things look like. Sarah, um, Sarah's actually done a really, really great job since she's been with us for a little over a year at this point, um, working on her mobility. And that's one of the biggest things that has kind of improved her deadlift from 500 to 600. Is that right? 500 in a suit to 600 raw. Um, is and She used to have to be almost her toes underneath the bar. She would actually come up almost into a calf raise, roll the bar back, use that bar to force her back onto her heels and then be able to stand up. So the fact that she's able to get this close to the bar just shows you guys how much of the other stuff she's working on and how much of a great job she's done in getting as limber as she is. So as you guys can see, kind of the difference in, in setup, let's do like two or three more, is she's going to have a little bit further of a, uh, uh, her back is going to be a little bit more bent over. Her chest isn't going to be up as high. 
sometimes as some of the other lifters you may see. And that's just, again, leverages, range of motion, and flexibility. But this is what works for her because she is one of the five females on the planet who have pulled over 600 pounds, right? So let's have Tiff deadlift sumo, and let's get some, uh, some more weight on this bar. Let's put another plate on over here. So again, very methodical, well thought out, and pulled. Good. Normally, I don't recommend thinking when you're deadlifting. Some of the, uh, the dumbest people that I know are the strongest deadlifters that I know. Uh, some of the smartest people that I know aren't necessarily the, the, the strongest deadlifters that I know. Um, I think people get lost in too much stuff. Yeah, add on whatever. We, we um, have to wait for you. you should, when, when you're up there, you should be trying to focus on one or two things. Your body can't move and think about a, a bunch of different stuff. So if you can kind of focus and boil things down to like one cue, then that's going to be fantastic. Jer, you want to jump into this? So Jer, when you're setting up, what are you, what are you thinking about? Or what are you trying to not think about? Or what are you focusing on? Not much. All right, there we go. <laughs> and that's why I deadlift 900 pounds, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs> so for Jeremy, as you guys can see, he's pretty fast. And that, that, that speed is going to remain there all the way up to about 900 pounds. So when Jeremy is going bad, one of the ways that I can try to start to reel him back in is to start reminding him to be fast, okay? Now, that may not, I'm not telling him to set up faster. I'm not telling him to take less time between sets. I'm just trying to get him to not think about a bunch of a shit and just grab the bar and kind of go. He can unconsciously get in a good position, you know, whenever he ends up wanting to. But if he starts to try and feel his way through things and get into a good position and, oh, hey, chest up like he's lost and so I can always tell when it's going to be a good day because if he can just walk up to it pull it and then walk away and disappear for like 10 minutes and then come back that's going to be a good day for Jer because he's kind of lost in his own world and he just kind of keeps coming back to that deadlift let's have Sarah jump in Sarah is a PhD in um, psychology so she's actually really smart but she's really strong too don't tell too many people about that. Sarah, what are you thinking about when you're deadlifting, when you're getting your setup? I try not to think. All right. Hey, deadlift, deadlift seminar over again. <laughs> nice. But seriously, what, what are you kind of concentrating on? What are the one or two things that you're focusing on as you go? So I'm trying to make sure I'm in the right position underneath the bar, right? So I'm sort of leaning forward this way to make sure that my shins are touching but not too far. Um, and then mostly remembering to take a breath every time. So really complicated stuff, right? Where are my feet? Do Am I tight? Right, you, <laughs> breathing. Um, really, really difficult stuff. Are you, waiting, are you waiting to start the deadlift until after you feel the bar kind of on your shins? There you go. That's a cue for you to start is when you can feel the cold bar on your shins. It's a good, uh, good cue for you to get moving. All right, Tiff. Oh, yeah, more weight, yeah. Good. Tiff successfully deadlifted 347 pounds at weighing 97 pounds. So about 3.5 uh, times body weight deadlift. So it's, um, it may not be the amount of plates that make it look super impressive, but when you really kind of get down for it, pound for pound, she's one of the strongest humans on the planet. Um, Tiff, what are you thinking about when you're getting into your pull? Uh, making sure my hands are the right way. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Taking deep breaths. Okay. Getting the feeling in my hamstrings so that I'm wedging myself under and then try not to think after. There you go. There's actually a time in one of the first meets that I was handling Tiff where it, during meat prep she was doing great, just crushing weights after weight after weight. And then we go to the, um, to, to the gym to, for, for where the meat was being held, and she missed her last two warm-ups. I was like, oh, my God. I was like, I don't know what the hell is going on. 
So she goes out and makes the, for her first attempt, which I actually had to lower, makes it look like a third attempt. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I was like, Tiff, are you, what are you doing differently? They're like, is there something, like, you just don't look yourself. Is everything okay? And I'm thinking, like, oh, you know, I don't feel so good, whatever it is. She's like, you know what? I don't remember which is my underhand, which is my oh, overhand. No. <laughs> and, that, and that's when I pulled the rest of my hair out. And I said, oh, well, let's go look at some Instagram videos and let's see which one we should. So I marked her hands and her wrists so she wouldn't forget on the second and third attempts, and she fucking smoked them. Coach of the year. <laughs> uh, tell us more about how you're wedging yourself under the bar. Can you maybe walk us through that? What's that mean? Uh, yeah, so I'm, when I go to pull the flock out, I get my hips up, and then when I'm pulling, I'm pulling myself under that bar so that everything's tight. So if I do it right, the weight starts to move really without me doing anything. And here, it will like float. Yeah, it floats. Yeah. And, and, and you said you're training. feeling your hamstrings, you're uh, yeah. getting like a stretch in your hamstrings first and then squatting in a position and going. Yeah, like feeling the tension there, yeah. So does everyone understand, kind of get that, see how much effort she's putting into her setup and how much tension she's putting into that bar. She weighs 100 pounds, that's 225. She's able to levitate it while talking to you guys. So she's putting so much stress and tension into that bar that that's just starting to float up before she even moves anything. Okay, so this is some of the, again, kind of the outside stuff that we're talking about, that once we get to the deadlift, all the other dominoes just kind of fall over as long as we get that right to start. Jerry, let's get moving again. So again, this is just going to be, we're working on speed reps here. It's all a speed game for Jerry. Good. With him, with him having uh, such a huge strength uh, towards being fast, what have you done to just get him brutally strong? Well, uh, like we talked about earlier, we stopped him deadlifting so often, and we put in things like this, like speed deadlifts, where we're using a percentage of anywhere between 50 and 70% working on just being really, really fast and really, really efficient and just practicing stuff over and over again. Because when we really think of it, you know, how many times are we going to be deadlifting over 95% of our one rep max? Not very often because you're not going to be able to recover from it. But somewhere along the way, you have to practice what you're going to go and do in the meet. So for our dynamic effort days, we always use the stance that we're going to use in a meet. And we always are trying to, you know, dynamic days, and we've always talked about this, and you've probably heard it a couple times, is we're here to... Um, practice perfectly and produce force. So that's what we're trying to work on on dynamic effort days, is making sure we're just dialing in our form and making sure that we're just brutally fast. So let's have, um, so that's, that's pretty much what I did with Jeremy, is just made him remember what it was like to be fast. Because he can jump to like a 65 inch box for some odd reason, it's again one of those weird things. So there's people who just have that sort of really, really fast twitch muscle here. And something that we always work on with Sarah is she has a tendency, she's got an unbelievably strong back. She's basically stiff leg deadlifted 550 pounds. So, but when she uses her legs, she gets a whole 50 more pounds. <laughs> so what we've tried to get with Sarah is to develop her leg strength for a long time because the coach that she was with stopped her from squatting. So her leg strength went down a ton and she, her lower back is just insane. So again, kind of one of those different perspective things I took a step back and was like, okay, cool. We're not going to deadlift as much, and we're going to get your legs strong, so when we get back to the deadlift, you'll be you know, a, a, a power, more powerful unit and kind of be able to get forward. So the fact that, A, she's a little bit more mobile and she's using her legs off the floor means that she's going to be able to deadlift whatever she wants. And she's worked very, very hard on it. Her squats come from like 300 to and a very painful 300 where we couldn't squat. We had to squat every, once every six weeks. That's how much it hurt her knees. And you just hit 500 for a triple the other day without any pain, raw, right? So, you know, that, that helps a little bit. All right, let's have her go. And again, she's just going to kind of find her way to the bar. And all I'll be yelling at her at the meet is big legs, big legs, big legs. <laughs> Good. 
Let's have Tiny set up again and get moving. We have 265 on the bar. What Tiny does really well, in my opinion, too, is you know she gets super, super tight through her middle. And she's one of the most effective when she's doing it right. And almost as she's starting to levitate that bar, she's going to start to push her feet through the floor. And her intention in her belt, she's pushing her belt through the floor as well. right? So she's trying to do, push everything away uh, into the ground and get her body behind that bar as fast as possible. And when she's going good, there's, you know, once that bar gets moving for Tiff, it may take a little while. I know she can lock it out. It may take a really, really long time. But as long as it's moving, I know she can end up locking it out. Let's have Jeremy jump in. So 400, four, four plates on for Jeremy is usually about the time that I make sure that he has shoes on and that he has his belt somewhere in the gym. Um, it doesn't always happen. He has a world, he has an all-time world record of deadlifting in uh, slides. He's deadlifted 815 in a pair of, were they Nike slides? Birkenstocks. Birkenstocks. Uh, let me do a Are you um, pretty So, upright, you know, you, uh, some people you got to really, well, you just got to make sure that they have, you know, footwear on that. Matches what they're supposed to do. I'm going to give Sarah another minute or so um, before she jumps in, before we give it to Tiny. Does anyone have any questions on some of the stuff that we're talking about or that we're, we're showing you guys? Some of the cues that we're giving, anything that they're doing that you're seeing that's different? Yep. Would you program for Sarah to help produce her knee pain? Say it again? Well, it was really interesting because initially I thought, okay, cool. You know, she, she does have a desk job, you know, and she's doing a lot of work. And um, I was like, maybe she just needs to be a little bit more flexible. and Maybe we need to just work on knee health. So we have things like TKEs, have her roll her IT band, make sure her quads are kind of, you know, roll those out and make sure that they're on and functioning while we were going. Uh, like a and eight. that got us a little, uh, and, and started yeah, uh, to have her squat because yeah, okay. she wasn't squatting. <laughs> um, that got us fairly far in doing some of that stuff. Um, but what, what really kind of took it over the top was, you know, we had a talk about, I was like, look, I know your knees hurt, and they're, they're probably never going to feel great. But I really think what we need to do is we need to really work on full range of motion squats. So we, um, something that I took from Max Aida, I took high bar, close stance, beltless squats, which is going to force you. You have absolutely no choice but to use your legs. So we gave her a steady diet of those and, uh, you know, gradually increased things and really worked on a lot of volume in, in that lift itself. And it really ended up making a huge difference. So there wasn't anything like one or two things specific that I did. We just honestly, we just got our knees and our legs strong. You'll be so surprised. People are going to walk into your gym, office, whatever. And if you can get them strong, so many pain, things that are hurting them, aches and pains are going to disappear. And it's because your body is meant to move one way. And if you're not strong, it's going to find a way to move what, the way that it can move. Not the most efficient or strong way, it's just going to move. So like I said with Sarah, she was just basically doing a stiff leg deadlift. But once we got our feet underneath her and got her legs moving, her deadlift has jumped over 100 pounds. And you know now she's one of the all-time best uh, female deadlifters of all time. Any other questions on something like that, accessory movements? We're, we're, we'll definitely go over this as we kind of go. But if anything that you guys see that kind of pops up for you, you know, kind of spit it out and, and let us know. Sarah, whenever you're ready. So as we kind of go, this is, you know, a little bit more than we would use for speed work. This is around the 70, 80 percent range for her. And we're getting close to almost actually an opener here for Tiff uh, because we rushed her through it and because she's just a jerk. So let's see this. Come on, Tiff. There you go. Easy. Nice. 
see how upright her body is. That's, that's actually like a skill. Like some of you might be able to do that right away um, for various reasons. Maybe you're just mobile enough to do it. And for others, it might take time. Like you might be, you might have your chest kind of pointed at the ground when you're in a sumo stance. Um, Ed Cohn, you know, one of the greatest lifters of all time, you know, deadlifting over 900 pounds at 220, he's able to have a really crazy upright posture due to his body type. Kind of has a short torso, got really, uh, really long arms, so he's able to be in a real good upright posture. But just know that this stuff, being able to get in these positions, these guys make it look so easy. And when you go to do it yourself, you'll be scratching your head because you're going to be like, I don't understand <laughs> why I'm not able to make it look the way these guys are today. And it's because this is something that they worked at for a really long time. So for some of you, you may have to spend a lot of time working on mobility to be able to get into some of these positions. The TKE, by the way, is... Uh, oh, right, sorry. I just set up this band right here. Tiff, you mind doing a TKE? Oh, Which block. stands for Terminal Knee Extension for anyone who wants to... No, or care. Whoa. Oh my God. So or care. Taller. Yeah. And then she's going to go ahead and take a little bit of a step back, make sure there's tension on the band. She's going to let her knee travel to about where her toe is, trying to stay up nice and tall. And then she's going to go ahead and kind of pull that back and kind of straighten her leg out as she kind of goes. Um, and the reason for this is, you know, it, it's a very easy intro to, to getting a lot of like blood flow and movement into your knee, especially for someone whose knees are uh, really kind of creaky, it's gonna really kind of activate your VMO, which is kind of the teardrop on the inside of your knee. You don't have to do that many, just keep going. They're getting a pump, um, it, which is responsible for your kneecap movement. Gotta do both so, I mean, it's just gonna help. It's just great for uh, knee health. 25 reps? 25 reps. Something you just, like just kind of get a little bit of a pump, a little bit of a burn, and that's gonna kind of, it's not gonna pre fatigue you but it's just going to kind of turn, um, turn your quads muscles on. Let's, uh, let's have Jeremy take five real quick. Jeremy also holds the deadlift, the, the all-time world record deadlift for forgotten belt deadlift. Um, he realized about 70% way, uh, of his way through, what was it, 840? 840. <laughs> Literally, when he got to here, he, oh my god, I forgot my belt. And then he locked it out, and then he dropped it and kind of walked off. So sometimes if you don't think, you're going to be strong. <laughs> So what we're going to do now is we're going to have uh, put 455 on the bar here. And we're going to put um, 310 on the bar over here. So we're starting to push uh, for, for Tiff. This will probably be her opener for Slingshot Record Breakers, which is in approximately four weeks or so. Uh, we'll, we'll be live streaming that. But if you guys want to come down and see the party and see the atmosphere and see something really awesome, uh, November 9 and 10, down in Dublin, California at my place. It's going to be a party. It's going to be so awesome. But if you can't make it in person, watch the live feed. It's going to be great. Uh, so this would be Tiff's opener, and 455 is going to get, well, you're going to probably, no. Yeah, this will probably be, this is about like last warm-up or so for, for Sarah. So something big, something that we're going to talk about, and something that we're going to give you guys when you're lifting is a little bit of atmosphere. Atmosphere goes a long, long way. When Mark talks to you about being around people who have the same goals, the same visions, and the same everything, that's the secret in the sauce, is to be motivated by the people around you once you get to a weight. Um, and it, like Sarah said something the other day when we were having her do an overload, it was a pride thing. She felt awful on her second, second rep, but she said there was no way that I was ever going to miss my third rep because I was too proud to do so. So what I want from you guys is a little bit of noise for Sarah because this yeah. is starting to get up there and the same thing for Tiff. Come on, Sarah, let's go! Let's go, let's see it now, come on. Right way, big legs, let's go! Come on, smash that weight now, let's see it. All the way through to the top now, yeah, easy. Easy weight. Flying up. There you go. She's so strong, it's crazy, craziness. Looked like chump change for her. 
Jesse, you mentioned not deadlifting. So, you right. know, what do people do instead of deadlifting to build up a strong deadlift? They just sit at home, play video games, and eat a sandwich? Well, that's what Jeremy does a lot. Um, but when he is in the gym, uh, we're using, you know, different muscles. We're, we're using different exercises that are going to stress the same muscles. So we're going to really prioritize things like hamstrings, glutes, lower back. So things like, you know, I really like things like box squats, hip thrusts, things along those lines. Uh, just tons and tons of hamstring curls, tons of just leg stuff to get people ready for that. So if I could kindly ask you to give Tiff a little bit of love as yeah. she gets her opener. Come on, Al, let's go. Come on, good strong pull all the way through. Stay with it, nice. Yeah. There you go, that was 90%. That's pretty good. Hi, babe. That felt really good. Awesome. I always like that. Let's, uh, Jeremy, you want to take one more? Go to sixth place for Jer. And then I think what we'll do is we're going to start to break you guys up into uh, groups. Corresponding uh, wristbands is going to tell you guys where to go throughout the gym. Something that I want you guys to kind of get ready for is you're going to be in a group of people, right? All deadlifting, all trying to learn, all trying to get better. Sounds like a pretty fucking cool atmosphere, right? Same atmosphere that we had here. We're going to crank the music. We're going to make this a training session because we want oh, this yeah, to be I fun for you. Music. And we want you guys to realize how important it is to be around the right people when you're lifting. Not only in life, not only to get you going in, you know, to your goals, to make sure things are going well for you, but also in lifting. It makes a huge difference. If you have one person that you can count on to be at that gym with you, your session, you're, you're so much more accountable and you're so much more likely to succeed. So get around those people, give them a little bit of love, and let's make sure that not only are you learning, but you're watching other people learn, you're listening to the cues that they're given, that they're given to you. Wonder, ask why, you know, they're getting this one, they're not getting this one. We'll help explain to you what we're trying to talk about so you can walk away with a whole bunch of new knowledge about the deadlift and also how to coach the deadlift and watch the deadlift. So let's give up, uh, let's give it up here for Jer. He's just gonna grab a couple here. Oh, yeah. Speed game. Let's go now, come on. Oh, Easy weight. Go, come on now, good speed, yep. Woo. Whoa. Nice. <laughs> I would, Jeremy, come on back up here for a second. Probably going to be asked this a million times. What's, uh, what's your favorite lift to supplement for deadlifts? Like, what's your favorite assistance exercise? Maybe not so much like an assistance exercise, but like our dynamic days, we get to practice our first rep a lot. So we might do 10 or 15 sets mm -hmm. of where we get to set up on the bar for one to three reps. And I guess the reason why we don't have to think about it so much by the time we're getting peaking is because we've set up, you know, if it's a 10 weeks, and we've set up, First reps, ten times, at least ten times every practice. A hundred times I get to set up on the bar. So by then I shouldn't have to think about it. Their uh, their dynamic effort work that he's talking about. They might use like say like sixty percent or seventy percent, and they might do ten sets of two or ten sets of three or fifteen sets of one. It gives you a lot of practice, and I think that for some reason in Olympic lifting they practice all the time. Right. But then we don't really see it from power lifters and, and bodybuilders will practice all the time. I mean, they will reduce the amount of weight that they're using so they can kind of get a mind-muscle connection so they can, flex the, the, they can flex their arm with weight in it. And if they can't flex their arm with weight in it, then they reduce the amount of weight. But as a power lifter, we're like, that don't make no sense. Why would I ever reduce the amount of weight? And so sometimes you got to go back, clean up the lift. I like what he said right there. What about um, you guys do a lot of max effort work? So they use the conjugate system. Conjugate system is uh, you're doing a, a variation of a deadlift, squat, or bench press uh, nearly every week, and you're probably not going to do a regular bench press or a regular squat or regular deadlift all that often. What's your favorite variation of a deadlift? Do you do a lot of conventional pulling because you pull yeah. sumo in the meet? We we'll probably pull more conventional, especially during the off season. Um, give my hips a break, at least for me. So we'll do a lot of a lot of conventional pulling. I think conventional pulling, if you're a sumo puller, probably your best run uh, to do. But as far as like sumo, uh, so I'll give one for conventional. I really like deficits, a uh, big old deficit, maybe even with a band, and just to get you kind of strong in bad positions and things like that, which you'll find yourself in max effort work at times. And then for sumo, I really like to go 
off of like a small block in the band. Uh, it just kind of really helps me like feel that tall position, you know, because it's even just an inch, extra inch off the ground for sumo, I think goes a long way. So that's, that's probably one of my favorites for sumo. I see a lot of young powerlifters uh, in a lot of pain, in a lot more pain than they should be or need to be in getting surgeries at young ages. Um, I've never had one surgery from powerlifting. I've torn a couple things, and maybe I needed it. Um, but I, I never needed a surgery for anything, and I was able to maintain uh, a high level of strength for a long period of time. If you're going to utilize periodization and you're going to utilize uh, people, people have, I don't really know how this kind of started, but people have mixed kind of old school periodization with high frequency training. And it's like those two things are not really meant to mesh together in that way. You're seeing a lot of athletes bench, squat, and deadlift sometimes uh, nearly every training session that they come in, which can actually work great, but you have to be systematic about it, and you're going to have to lower those percentages. You're going to have to change things up. So the only people I see that are surviving that, are still, that have a long lifting career are the ones that are applying a lot of knowledge to it. So if you're doing periodization, those things work great. I've utilized that as well, as well as uh, the conjugate system. They both work good, but they can both be disastrous if you're not paying attention to how heavy and how often you're doing it. If you're going to use a, a periodization going into a meet, you're going to have to go back down in your strength. You're going to have to go back and rebuild. Um, as uh, Ed Cohn used to always say, you're going back and you're going to build a bigger foundation every single time you go back to the drawing board. But the only way to do that is with higher reps and lower weight. And I think, you know, in this kind of Instagram phase that we're in, everybody wants something to post. And they're like, ah, if I'm only moving three plates, like that's not really much of a post. I need, I need four plates like I did last week. You're going to have to, if you want to be great, you're going to have to really learn how to kind of pull back. And that's what he'd said about him coming in through the doors, right? He was deadlifting three times a week. They de he probably does a, a regular deadlift, as you saw right there, maybe a couple times a month on a speed day only. And the only time that he actually does a regular sumo deadlift that's 80% and above in a 12-week training period might only be like once. Yep. Yeah, so that's a, that's a, a, a different way of training. And you could do... You can do periodization. You can do other forms of training. They, they all work really well. But be very cautious with how often you're going heavy and understand that no matter what you're doing, you're going to have to figure out a way to rebuild. The way that they rebuild with the conjugate system is they might go and do a, a low box squat. You know, they might stay away from a regular deadlift for, for a while. That's a way of, like, deloading the deadlift while still getting a great training stimulus. Something that I'm really proud of, um, it, this is also with my lifting career, but also with uh, all of my lifters, is our platform lifts, meaning the lifts that we complete in a sanctioned powerlifting meet, are always bigger than all of the lifts we completed in the gym. How many times do you see someone, oh, going to war next week, and you know, all this other shit, and then they get to the meet, and they underperform by 5, 10, 15%. Or maybe they don't even make it all the way to the end of the meet. Now, I'm not telling you guys that the only reason to powerlift is to compete, but just have an idea. You know, you only have so many bullets in the chamber, okay? You only have so many times that you can try a 900 pound deadlift or whatever your 900 pound deadlift is before something is going to go wrong if you don't. Give yourself enough time to recuperate, recover, and go from there. So something that we do, we always overperform. The first time she deadlifted 347, the most she'd ever deadlifted in the gym was 315. So I'm asking her to do 10% more, and it was easy. And why is that? Because we've managed a lot of the other stuff around it, and we haven't just ran her head into the wall over and over and over again. She is fresh. She is injury-free. And more than that, she is properly prepared to get there. And she has practiced her skill over and over and over again to the point where she can do it in her sleep. She may forget how to hold the, the, the barbell, but I mean, you know, that's minutia. And that's just one of those things. So when you see all these people on Instagram putting up these lists, it's not real life. That's not actually what's really happening. The people who have, you know, who've been in this sport for a long, long time, they understand that that's a show. And that's all that that is. So, you know, don't be afraid to do the work. 
I have two daughters that are 12, and they're going through math right now. And I'm horrible at math. But the one thing that I know is when I do an equation, I have to write everything down. And I have to show my work step by step so I can see where I fucked up and how I got the answer wrong. Okay? And I can go back and trace what I did wrong and what I need to work on from there. Right? If you're not showing your work in the gym, if you're not doing the reps on your way up, if you're not putting the time in getting stuff better that you get wrong often, you're never going to be able to complete that equation properly. You're always going to get it wrong. Show your work. Don't be afraid to show that you did a 225-pound deadlift for three reps for 10 sets. People who care, like, that person's putting in work. That person is showing up every day and getting better every day. It doesn't necessarily have to be super showy, but they're there, they're consistent, and they're going to be consistent over a long period of time, and that's going to win. So don't get too caught up when you see all that other stuff because the people who do it right and set all-time world records are underperforming in the gym. What do we got? Uh, we're going to go ahead and take a... Okay, so um, Smoke's going to go ahead and talk to you guys, but what I want you guys to start to get into and start to wrap your head around is I want the same energy that you gave Tiff, Jeremy, and Sarah for their deadlift on all the platforms that we have. I want everybody involved, and um, all the coaches are gonna be involved. We're here to get you better. Take advantage of it. Let's make this like a training session, and let's have a fucking good time. Hell yeah. yeah. All right, guys, now we have the fun part coming on. So uh, one, if uh, after I'm done, you guys all pick up your chairs, and we're going to put them all in the corner so it's out of the way, and the rest of our team is going to move all the other uh, equipment that you guys are sitting on. Then everyone look at the number that's on your bracelet, and we're going to have huge signs with Team ST is going to be uh, in charge of each station, and then we're going to have our coaches uh, walking around helping each station. So again, we're going to move all the chairs out of the way, look at your number, find your corresponding sign, and we're going to work up to something kind of challenging, uh, one or two reps. So yeah, so again, let's kind of warm up. Take your time warming up. If you need to take weight off the bar, that's great. We're gonna look for something like an eight or an 80%, eight out of 10 today. If you feel good, great, keep moving. If not, just stay where you are and let's just get some work done. Yeah. Look at those balls.